Hello and welcome to another multiple choice question walkthrough, this time looking at the amount of substance topic. Feel free to download the questions from the description, have a go at them, then watch this video back and see how you got on. What is the empirical formula of 4-hydroxy pent 2 e Well, the empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. So before we can work out what the empirical formula is, we need to know what the compound actually looks like, or at least what its molecular formula is. Since we haven't been given any indication, we need to draw it. So it is pentene, first of all. So let's get our chain of five drawn for pent. And one of the bonds is going to be a double bond because it is pentene. It is pent 2-ene, and that means that the double bond needs to be coming from the second carbon atom in the chain. In fact, it means it needs to be between the second and the third carbon atom in the chain, because if it was between the first and the second, it would be pent 1-ene. And then now we've started numbering from the left-hand side, we need to work our way along to the fourth carbon atom here and add a hydroxy group to that carbon atom. A hydroxy group is what would be called an alcohol if that double bond wasn't there. This would be pentan-2-ol if the double bond wasn't there. But we've now drawn 4-hydroxypent-2-ene. And so its molecular formula when we count up all the atoms is C5H10O. We cannot simplify this ratio and make it any smaller at all because we've already got just the single one oxygen. And so the empirical formula is C5H10O. D is a decoy, and that's because it's trying to give us the correct formula, but show us that it is an alcohol. In an empirical formula, we don't give any indication as to what the functional groups are present in a particular compound, just the ratio of the atoms of each element. The maximum uncertainty when weighing 0.250 grams on a balance was 0.001 grams. What is the percentage uncertainty? Well, percentage uncertainty is found by taking the absolute uncertainty that they've called the maximum uncertainty here. We divide it by what we're measuring and we multiply it by 100. We also need to be mindful of the fact that we need to account for any multiple readings that we might be taking for a particular measurement. So, for instance, a change in temperature or a change in mass. Here it's just a single reading that we're taking, so we only have one of that maximum uncertainty. We divide it by 0.25, we multiply it by 100, and we get 0.4%, and so B is the correct answer. Which of these contains the most molecules? Well, first of all, we don't have to do any Avogadro's constant calculations. We just need to know that the substance with the bigger number of moles will contain the bigger number of molecules. And so what we're really doing here is working out which of these contains the most moles. And so we have to be careful here because moles is mass divided by MR, but some of these are not in grams yet and they need converting. And so in grams, this is actually 31.1 grams. We divide it by the MR of carbon dioxide, which is 44, and we get 0 0.707 moles of CO2. For B, the MR of carbon monoxide is 28, and so we have to do 29.6 divided by 28, which gets us 1.06 moles of carbon monoxide. So we now know that A is wrong because B has got a bigger number of moles. Then for C, we've got 2.22 times 10 to the 4 milligrams of oxygen, which we then need to divide by 1,000 to turn it into grams of oxygen, which gets us 22.2 grams. We divide that by the MR of oxygen, which is 32. And in fact, we don't even need to calculate this because we can tell from the fraction it's going to be less than 1. And then for D, we see that we've got 13.3 grams of ozone, which we divide by its MR, which is 48. And again, we can see from the fraction it's going to be less than 1, so we don't really need to calculate this one either. And we can see that B is the correct answer because it has got the largest number of moles, and therefore the largest number of molecules. Here we're being shown an unbalanced equation, and our job is to balance the equation and to find out what the mole ratio is for sulfuric acid to water in that order, and that's important. So when we skim through this equation, we're only actually putting numbers into two positions here 
and here. When you're balancing a complicated equation like this, it's important to start with the element that we know almost everything about. So these structures have got hydrogen, sulfur and oxygen in on the left and hydrogen and oxygen on the right. So what that means is we know everything about the sulfur on the right hand side in the products. And so what you can see is that there is SO4 three times over in this substance. So that means that there will be three sulfur here. And there is SO4 once in potassium sulfate. So there'll be a fourth sulfur atom here. So we have four atoms of sulfur on the right hand side, which means we will need a four in front of the H2SO4 on the left. So it's looking like C or D is going to be the correct answer here, because this gives us our ratio of for to something. Then we need to look at our water and probably the easiest thing to balance here is going to be the hydrogen because oxygen appears in all three spaces in the reactants but you could balance with the oxygen. I'm going to pick the hydrogen. So in our molecule here we've got three lots of H2. That gives us six hydrogen. And we've got this 4 that we've just put in front of the H2SO4. So 4 times 2 is 8. So we've got our 8 plus our 6, which gives us 14 hydrogen on the left-hand side, which means we need 7 H2O on the right-hand side to balance for that. And the ratio is therefore 4 to 7, and it's C. Two moles of ideal gas X are stored in a flask of fixed volume. Which of the following changes would lead to the greatest increase in pressure inside the flask? This question is making it look like you have to do eight ideal gas calculations for pressure. You don't, but there's still quite a bit of work to do. We have to use PV equals NRT in the arrangement of P equals NRT divided by V. Since we've got a fixed volume, it's constant, we can remove it. R is the gas constant, we can remove it. So we're left with P being proportional to moles times by temperature. And we're not interested in what the actual pressure will be, we're just interested in how many times bigger or smaller it will be. So in A, when the temperature is changing from 293 Kelvin to 473 Kelvin, that will be an increase of 473 divided by 293, which is 1.61. In B, the moles is going to increase from 2 to 3. Well, that will be 3 divided by 2 times bigger, so 1.5. C gets trickier because we're adding 0.5 moles, so we're going from 2 to 2.5, and the temperature is changing from 293 Kelvin to 423 Kelvin. So we've actually got two fractions here. It's 2.5 divided by 2 and 423 divided by 293, which gives us a total of 1.8 times bigger. So C is looking the biggest so far. Last of all, we're removing one half of a mole of gas, so it's going from 2 down to 1.5, and the temperature's going from 293 Kelvin to 573 Kelvin. And so this is going to be 1.5 divided by 2 multiplied by 573 divided by 293, which gives us a total of 1.47, which is smaller than 1.8, so C is the correct answer. This question is telling us that the MR of hydrated copper sulfate, formula shown here, is 249.6. And we're being asked what the mass of hydrated copper sulfate is that is required to make 50 cm cubed of 0.4 moles per dm cubed of solution. And so what we need to do to find mass ultimately is multiply the MR by the moles. And so therefore, given that we've got the MR, we're trying to find out what the moles are. We know that the volume is 50 cm cubed and we know what the concentration is. So the first job is to turn that 50 cm cubed into dm cubed by dividing by 1000, so 0 0.05. And moles of solution is concentration times by volume, so 0 0.4 times by 0 0.05, which gets us 0 0.02 moles of the hydrated copper sulfate. Mass is MR times moles, so 249.6 times by 0 0.02, which gets us 4.99 grams, and so D is the correct answer. A student is provided with 5 cm cubed of a sample of hydrochloric acid with a concentration of 1 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per decimeter cubed. 
they are asked to divide a method to prepare a hydrochloric acid solution with a concentration of 5 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per decimeter cubed by diluting the sample with water. Which of these is the correct volume of water that should be added? Well, what's important to note here is that by adding water, all we're doing is diluting the acid. And so what I mean by that is the moles of acid that we have before we dilute it will be the same as the moles we've got after the dilution has occurred. And since moles is concentration times by volume, what we can say is concentration times volume before will be equal to concentration times volume after. So when we do 1 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by 5, that's equal to 5 times 10 to the minus 4 multiplied by whatever the final volume is going to be. When we rearrange that and crunch the numbers, we find that the final volume will be 100 centimetres cubed. Now, we started with 5 cm cubed, we've gone to 100 cm cubed, so the volume that should be added is going to be 95. That's the difference between those two. And so the correct answer is B. And C was a decoy for people who didn't spot that it was what volume has been added to the initial solution. Here we're being asked which of the following contains the most chloride ions. To solve this problem, we need to first recognise that chloride ions are Cl minus, and so aluminium chloride will be AlCl3 because aluminium is in group 3 and so will be a 3 plus ion. Calcium is in group 2, so it will be 2 plus as an ion, so calcium chloride is CaCl2. Hydrochloric acid, you'll probably remember, is HCl, and sodium chloride, NaCl. And so what we can see is that each of these formulae have a specific number of chloride per formula. And so what we need to do now is process the number of moles that we've got of each of these compounds and multiply it by the number of chloride ions per formula. Because multiple choice questions need to be fast, we can cut corners here because we don't actually need to work out the number of moles. We can just work out the value that is proportional to that number of moles. So for instance, moles is equal to concentration multiplied by volume in decimeters cubed. All of these are in cm cubed, but that doesn't matter here because we don't need the number of moles, just the value proportional to it. And all of the values have, for concentration have got the same standard form in them. So we could just ignore it. And so for A, we need to do 10 multiplied by 3.3 multiplied by 3 for the number of chloride ions per formula. And that gets us 99. For B, we do 20 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 2, which gets us 200. 30 times by 3.3 multiplied by 1 is 99. 40 times by 2.5 multiplied by 1 is 100, and we can see therefore that B has got the largest number, which means it will have the most chloride ions for that volume. Magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid according to the following equation, and then a student calculated the minimum volume of 2.56 moles per decimeter cube concentration hydrochloric acid, required to react with an excess of magnesium to form 5.46 grams of magnesium chloride. Which of the following uses the correct standard form and the appropriate number of significant figures to give the correct result for the volume of hydrochloric acid? So first of all, it says give the correct standard form. If we look down these options, we can see instantly that D does not obey the rules of standard form. We should only have one digit before the decimal place. And this has got 44.8 before the standard form. So D is wrong. And then it also says the appropriate number of significant figures. Well, if we look at the data in the question, that has all been given to three significant figures, which means our final reported answer needs to also be to three significant figures which means we can rule out A because that's actually to four significant figures. And now we're just deciding between B and C. To do this, we actually do have to do a calculation. We know that we've been given a lot of information about magnesium chloride and we're interested in hydrochloric acid. So we can work out the moles of magnesium chloride that have been produced by doing mass divided by MR, so 5.46 divided by 95.3, and that gets us 0 0.0573 moles. 
The ratio of hydrochloric acid to magnesium chloride is 2 to 1, so the moles of HCl will be twice as big, so 0.115 moles. We know the concentration is 2.56, and we know that moles is concentration times volume, so the volume is moles divided by the concentration, and that gets us 0 0.0448, and so that means that B is the correct answer once we convert that to standard form. Here we're being asked which of these samples of gas contains the largest number of molecules, and they've given us the gas constant, which is the signpost that we're using the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. Now, we need the number of molecules, which is obviously going to be proportional to the number of moles, so we need to have n equals PV divided by RT. We don't actually need the number of molecules, we just need a number that's proportional to the number of molecules. And so, rather than running all four of these calculations and dividing each of them by R, let's just not bother because R is a constant. And so we can do PV divided by T for each of these. Before we dive in on the calculations, it's important to make sure that the units are all correct. The temperatures are all in Kelvin, the pressures are all in Pascals, these bottom two volumes are in decimeters cubed, and volume needs to be in meters cubed, so each of those needs to be divided by 1000. When we run the numbers for A, we get 1.67 as our value. When we plug the pressure and the volume and the temperature in for B, we get a value of 2, so already we can see that B is a bigger number, so we can rule out A. Plugging the values in for C gives us 1.8, that's not as big as 2, so C is wrong, and then for D we plug the numbers in and we get 1.33, which is even smaller, and so we can see that B is the correct answer because it has a value proportional to the number of moles that is biggest, and that means it will have the largest number of molecules. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.